Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael on Double Feature. And uh, we have two films today about, I don't know, human beings. Yeah. That's the most I got for you. I'm going to go with human beings. Okay. I, we, can, we can go with human beings. We can go with uh, England. We could go a little, yeah. We could go a little English here. I think we're going to learn about people today. Okay. I want to say it's both sides of the spectrum. I want to spectrum, say just, and by spectrum, you mean whether they're happy or sad. <laughs> that's the spectrum uh, that you're speaking on. Human beings have a lot of spectrums. Fear and love are the... Sorry. I'm, I'm thinking Melinda and Melinda. Right? Sure. I'm thinking comedy and tragedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, roughly, you could consider one of these a comedy and yeah. the other a tragedy. Right. I, I suppose that works. Yeah. What are the two movies on the show? We're going to do Closer and Happy Go Lucky. So we'll start out with the downer. Yeah. And then uh, we'll talk about Happy Go Lucky, which is quite obviously from the title, the, uh, the brighter, the happier the not of, downer. The two, right, of the two films. Now, my plan here today is to actually spoil the contents of both of these films right that, on our show. That's impressive. I'm really excited for that. So if you saw Closer once in 2004 and mm-hmm. forgot what happened, you should probably skip over that to Happy Go Lucky, which is a film that I'm assuming next to no one has seen. Yeah, I had never heard of it. Uh, but also awesome. Yeah, So very good. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't seen either of these films, there's going to be some spoilers. There's going to be some character stuff. You should just skip over, come back to it later, download the show, stick it on your computer, when you watch the movie four years from now, you'll have a nice little surprise sitting in your downloads folder. Wow. You can use the chapters uh, that are a, a part of the show, a feature of our show. A feature probably, of double feature? It's probably the it, best feature of our show. I would say the, the best feature of our show is probably behind the mask. That would be the best film featured on oh, the show. sorry. I get Also, possibly not true. It's almost like, David it's Stevie very likely not listening. true. David Stevie not listening. Not true. Not true at all. Anyways, what was I saying? Chapters. Use the chapters to skip over or the time codes or it, you, you've got the hang of this thing by now. This is somebody's first episode of Double Yeah, Feature. if you don't know what to do with chapters, uh, listen to next week's episode or the previous week's episode because right. I'm sure we really nailed it one of those two times. Ask a friend. Now we're going to start with Closer and uh, I don't have a lot written That's great. on the iPad about Closer. Okay. I just assumed you would run with this as far as humanly possible. I will, and I'm going to need you to to stop me when uh, when we get to Happy Go sure. Lucky Train. Sure. Uh, the only thing I need to say about Closer is when I saw it, it had a really great trailer that had um, is it Susan Vega, Suzanne Vega? I think it's Susan Vega, right? The song uh, Caramel. Yeah, I'll, I'll it, which is great. It's yeah, it's a wonderful loungy. It's an amazing song, and I've had it since then, and I still listen to it. Uh, almost daily for some reason. <laughs> it's an incredible song. That ends what I've prepared for uh, okay. for the show today. Well, then I guess I'm gonna have to. I guess I'm gonna have to take the reins Step here. Step up. Okay. So closer is. I saw it in the theater when it came out in 2004, and sure. at the time, it totally blew my mind. I had never seen anything like it. To be honest, I've still not seen much like it. Sure. Probably because I don't usually watch films that are right. like closer. Well, you and I were wondering quite a bit about this. Right. If it is really. Uh, the only thing of its kind. Yeah. Or if perhaps every Julia Roberts movie is like this, right. we just have no idea. Exactly. But the thing the thing that you brought up while we were watching it and that I'm I'm really glad you brought up because mm-hmm. I'm glad that it was at least semi obvious sure. is you mentioned the shape of things. Ah, right. Something we did uh back in I believe year one. Yeah. Uh Rachel Weiss, Paul Rudd. Sure. And, it was right around Tank Girl right, somewhere. Right. And the big thing that we talked about with that film was that it was based on a play and a lot of the actors were in the original production. Sure. And so it translated a little bit weird to screen. So the thing about Closer is it too is based on a play. Mm -hmm. And the two male actors, Jude Law and Clive Owen, who play Dan and Larry respectively, were both in, I believe, the original stage production of Closer. The difference here is I can't see how you would make closer an effective play. Sure. Within the film, they do a lot of time jumping and switching scenes, and it's always just conversations between people. Right. And the thing about switching scenes as quickly as they do in the film, I can't see it being easy to do that in a stage production sense 
without disconnecting people for any period of time sure. between these conversations. Yeah, this is one of those things that sometimes when you watch a movie a million times, you get a better sense of a lot of things about the movie. You yeah. learn more about it, you pick up on more. Mm -hmm. This is one of those oddities, having uh, seen Closer a bunch, I don't remember if it was ever difficult for me to pick up on the time yeah. or if that was always... And now it's it's fairly obvious that they're right. skipping, you know, right. uh, basically every scene is a yeah, pretty yeah. big jump. Well, the whole film, the whole film takes place over about four years mm -hmm. and within the film, there's maybe a handful, let's say maximum 10, 12 different conversation scenes, sure. which have to take place over four years. So there are some serious time jumps right. that go on with these four people's lives. And, and I remember too, watching it, for the second, third, fourth time, always being surprised by the time jumps because in my head, it takes place over such a long period of time and three or four scenes in, we're already at somebody breaking up. Sure. And that always used to surprise me because I was always trying to play catch up with the film because I felt like it was leaving me behind. Right, absolutely. The thing that I really, really love about this film, and I do absolutely adore Closer, it's no secret, it's... Sure. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Mm -hmm. I love the time jumping. I love the fact that every scene is just two people in conversation. It is. Yeah. There's basically, unless the characters are moving around to right. go talk to the other exactly. characters, uh, there's rarely, if ever, a scene that has a, I'll say there's never a meaty section of dialogue right. before uh, between more than two people. Yeah, exactly. You know, you have the scene toward the beginning where the three of them are all in the room. But mm -hmm. Natalie Portman's character even you know, tells him, you have to leave. Yeah, <laughs> so, and before that, she goes to the bathroom. Right, they'll kick characters yeah, out of scenes. Exactly. They don't want more than two people on stage right. at all times. Right, so basically what goes on in Closer is you get these four people who all have sex with each other, and then one of them wins. Right. <laughs> Essentially, it's, it's almost That's a character... That's an interesting point of view you have there. It's a character study where it takes four different types of people. You have a romantic, sure. which would be Dan, Jude Law's character. Right. You have a liar, which would be Natalie Portman, the stripper, the Alice or Jane character. Right. You have the honest bastard douchebag. Sure, which character is that? Played by uh, Clive Owen. Oh, excellent. And then you have this... I, I can't pigeonhole julia roberts character um other than slut yeah, um because but like it, i don't mean it in a negative way <laughs> right okay. it's just that she definitely they say it in the film between in the scene where larry and dan are talking um in the doctor's office which is one of the funnier ones right larry points out that anna julia roberts loves a guilty fuck and that's what i really feel like fuels sure anna's character sure. is this underlying drive to be a bad girl but right. like in a really dirty way sure. not in a i'm a stripper way yeah and so that's essentially what you get is a character study of these four types of people mixing bodily fluids with each other betraying their monogamous yeah, situation exactly and that's the other thing about the film is a lot of it is betrayal but you have to accept that they're all in monogamous relationships. Right. Because a lot of the time, specifically in the scene at the opera house, sure, where Dan and Anna are talking, Anna has just fucked Larry in order to get him to sign the divorce papers, right, right. which is the only scene where they really do a flashback instead of a flash forward sure. or jump forward, I guess. In, in that scene, Dan says, you know, you had sex with him. I can't believe it. And she said, I didn't give him anything. You know, it, it didn't mean anything. Right. And Dan's all upset because they had sex, but to Anna, it really wasn't a serious thing. Sure. So if you're of the mindset that polygamy is an option, which in 2004, I was in high school. That was not an option. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I wish someone would have told me in high school. Right. That that was. An yeah, option, exactly. Right? Um, that wasn't until right about after high school, I think, that I started having open relationships. Yeah. And the, really, the one vital mistake in my entire sexual history is not being aware that in high school, I will be surrounded by 4,000 people who, half of which are women, in their, I don't want to say sexual prime, but... Uh, sexual willingness stage? <laughs> well, you know, I don't even know if that's true. Yeah, that's I think true. I think maybe as you um, as you grow into adulthood, let's mm -hmm. say, let me make this sound like a really mature conversation. Please, too. As you get five or ten years older, yeah. you loosen up on these personal sexual restrictions sure. Sure. That, that you might have for yourself. 
So being in high school, you are surrounded by thousands of people who will probably have sex with you under yeah. the right right scenario. Yeah, absolutely. That's an amazing situation that for anybody who's listening to the show and in high school, that will never happen again. Yeah, you need to take advantage of that. Uh, right you need now. To take, you need to take full advantage. As of, frequently and with as many uh, willing consensual partners as possible. Absolutely. Safely. Anyways, you were trying to make a point. Well, the point that I'm making is that you have to accept the monogamy in this film. Sure. And the reason that I like that the one scene where monogamy gets called into question slightly, the opera house scene, right. it's Dan's character and Anna's character. Mm -hmm. Anna's having sex because she likes the way it feels to be dirty. Yeah. So she says that it means nothing, which is a lie. And Dan is a romantic, so having sex at all with anybody that's not him is, is completely not allowed. Oh, if it were guy. either of the other two characters involved... You could believe that there was some innocence there, but fortunately, sure. it's written in such a way that the two characters who cannot really deal with polygamy mm -hmm. are forced into right. talking about it. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to make it sound... It's comical for me to think of Closer as a film where a bunch of people have problems that could be avoided if they were all okay with having sex But I mean, that's, mo that's how most films are. Yeah. <laughs> it, basically, sure. this is, that, that sure. is your suspension of disbelief for right. Closer. Yeah. If, there were any, if there were any parameter of suspension of disbelief, you have to suspend your disbelief in that monogamy is the only accepted principle. Well, but there's nothing wrong with monogamy if, if you're not putting magic into it. Yeah. If it's little more than a sexual kink, if it's an agreement that two human beings have decided to participate in, uh, ultimately the ability to make agreements, uh, something important that puts us above, I don't know, animals, right? Yep. Totally a fine decision for two people to make. Mm -hmm. Dan himself obviously could probably never engage in right. open relationships, although it you know, when you look at the amount of pain these people have suffered yeah. through, you start to think, Dan, would trying an open right. relationship, maybe, <laughs> right. maybe could it get any worse for him? Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, well, see, that's the thing is, so at the end of the film, there are a few other scenes that I want to talk about specifically, but I think it's important to, to kind of wrap up what ends up happening here. And it's that at the end of the film, the underhanded, mean bastard of a man mm -hmm. who i will i will contend is the only really honest guy he does cheat but he immediately comes clean mm -hmm. he's not a nice guy he's got a very he's a direct guy yeah exactly he gets to the point he is forward and he's the one that ends up winning at the end they have the sadness montage over the blower's daughter the damien rice song right. which to me is the closer song and i adore it um, especially in that opening scene, which I want to touch on. To me, it's the song that's not caramel, so it makes me yeah, a little sad inside. I'm sorry about that. But at the end, we have Larry wins. I love how simple that is for you. Yeah, well, I, it, he, they show the montage, and the only person who's sleeping soundly, who's not bummed, <laughs> the Larry wins montage. Who didn't get right. who didn't get their heart broken, who's not in a shitty situation, right. is Larry. Larry played the cards. He fucked everybody. Larry fucks everyone. <laughs> sure. And he ends up winning. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, when did Larry and Dan have sex? Well, they spend a lot of time asking the girls about each other. So I <laughs> really, I never even questioned that. But sure, when did they have sex? Well, I, I actually, I fully agree with your previous point of the fact right? that they both know so much about each I other mean, sexually. A lot. They well, seem just as obsessed with each other there's as that, with the women. There's that really, really, really good scene, right, between Larry and Anna right before they break up sure. after he gets back from his business trip. Right. And they preface this scene a little bit when Dan and Anna are talking at the photo shoot and they're talking about the book, which ends up being called the aquarium. Yeah. And he asks her if she thought it was too dirty or risque. And she says, no, it's accurate. That's how sex is. That's how people talk about sex. Right. If you're going to have a book where people talk about sex, it's going to seem dirty and a little bit offensive and perverted. And we've already seen that Larry's kind of a pervert. Yeah. Um, in the in the uh, the fucking uh, what was it? a chat room? Was the that internet what wank scene. Yeah. yeah. There was a chat room. And uh, can I derail you for a please moment here? Derail me. This is bizarre. Yeah. This as I'm watching this movie, 2004. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Yeah. Now we can see these movies from the 90s now, and we we know the 90s aesthetic. You know, we've seen a lot of that stuff on the show. 
and uh, the decades previous to that have uh, very clear aesthetics too. And in the last 10 years, some movies are a little older than others, but most seem fairly modern. Mm -hmm. They don't date themselves too much. This 2004 film appears to be out of some missing year of time yeah, it that does. I was not aware of. It's very it, true. First of all, these four actors. Right. Very much. Powerhouses 20, in 2004, 2004 and right. never before and never again. Yeah. Uh, w one film a year mm -hmm. afterwards. Except Jude Law, as you mentioned. Except Jude Law. Very strange. <laughs> uh, the other thing is the way they talk about the net. The let's net. call it. Uh, do you remember the Sandra Bullock film, The Net, by the way? I, I, yeah, I saw it once. If you have anything to say to me about The Net, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I'm not even sure where I was going with that. Uh, just such a weird thing. We called it the internet. For, mm. Back when seven, maybe eight people were on the internet, right. I think one of them thought, all right, I have the power right now. Before it becomes popular, I'm going to get people to call this thing The Net, and then that'll be my thing. I got people to call it that. And it never caught on. <laughs> but it's weird seeing their chat interface yeah. and the way they speak. The, the fucking quote from the movie is perfect. Uh, you know, it's an extraordinary thing. The internet. The possibility of genuine global communication. <laughs> the first great democratic medium. Two guys wanking in cyberspace. Yeah. That's, that's really... It, it's still now. Sums it's true. Up. <laughs> it's completely sums true. Sums up the internet beautifully it's completely wow. true and that scene where they where they're where they're having the sex chat with the score and all the sure one, oh i just i love that scene can in, that count as entire. my favorite scene yeah it, yeah is that your favorite scene i was I, gonna I ask think, you what your favorite oh, scene yeah is. absolutely i mean you know i know they're not in the same room so yeah, there's, it's a but little it's bit still of a scene. conversation it's they corresponded is. it certainly is <laughs> it's amazing yeah uh and just to see him smoking right sure. the non-smoker uh, to see him smoking and then typing away in the, the tiny little office yeah. that Clive Owen's character is in. Uh, every, just, everything about that. And he's great. just a doctor and he gets a call. Sure, sure. But in the meantime, he's talking about a girl being in a queue of strange... Right. Like, it's just this, it's this wonderfully depraved moment where these two yeah. characters are... Well, one of them is really opening up and the other one is really just being a jerk. I love that by the end of the movie, he's got this this big, luxurious office. Yeah, this, yeah. And, you know, in the beginning of the movie, he looks like... Remember the guy in the back of the stock warehouse and look? Yeah. Who yeah. would have sex with people right. and then had right. to answer the phone? That's pretty much uh, stolen from Closer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not, but it's, it's, the, <laughs> it's the exact same uh, right. location. Those guys could identify very well with each other. <laughs> and then you see the same character, the, the Larry, the doctor... Uh, in the white coat, the sure. Sultan of Twat. Um, <laughs> you see his his kind of he calls it perversion, but it's not perversion. It's a sexual kink that he has where he's just really into detailed sexual stuff. It's just a graphic. Sure, he has a graphic mind when it comes to right. sex, and you see that change because it's the same thing when he's demanding that Anna tell him Absolutely, all about yeah. having sex with Dan. For sure, it's the same. It's the same thing in his brain that demands that he right. knows, you know, where they had sex and if she came and how his cum tastes. Right. Just, it's the same. Her response to that, by the way, is the best thing ever. Well, that whole exchange, I think, that just those two lines, what sure. it is cum tastes like. Like yours only sweeter. Yeah. I think. Was... And then he says, he says, thank you. Now fuck off and die. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, as if he needs to know. He's right. gotten everything he needs out right. of this now. He's glad she was honest. Yeah. This is the exactly. end of the conversation. Yeah. Before we get into the kind of headier double feature territory, there's one more part, like context of the film that I want to talk about. And I know there's something sure. that you want to talk about within the context of the film too. But the first opening scene of this movie, again, we have the blower's daughter, Damien Rice, Jude Law, Natalie Portman walking toward each other in slow motion. Right. Everything at this moment, everything is so innocent. Nothing has gone wrong sure. for any of sure. these four people. And it's all in slow motion. It's basically, it seems like you're watching two people fall in love in the stereotypical slow motion, walk towards each other, embrace, score swell, love forever. You're savoring the simple moment right. of, of the film. You're basically watching a train wreck in slow motion sure you're sure. watching these two people and what seems like should be a wonderful moment colliding yeah crashing into each other destroying each other's lives right. and 
collateral damage. Sure, sure. Right? You're thinking the whole time, the first time you watch this movie, you're thinking, oh, this is a beautiful moment. The second time you're like, let her get hit by that car. (laughs) Sure. Let her stay there. Just walk away. Write her obituary. You're so close. You never have to be connected to this person. You can still be saved. (laughs) Right. And you just watch the very first moments of these people's lives just these four people's lives just start getting ravaged sure just because these two people happen to make eye contact on the right. street and you have this romantic song and it's just it it goes back to the scene where alice is talking to larry at anna's exhibition mm. and alice is talking about how the photos are a lie because it seems beautiful but the people are unhappy but it's reassuring and I, the film does a lot of meta stuff. I already right. talked about when they discuss the book sure. and later get into the sexual thing. But I feel like it's really light and it's kind of a double commentary on actual art. But Well, and the fact that they're in a gallery. Right. And exactly. Clive Owen's character exactly. makes fun of well, yeah. talking about the right. <laughs> discussing exactly. the work at the opening of the work. <laughs> and uh, the, it's basically the same thing where it looks like this beautiful moment is happening, but it's really just the it's the beginning of a very sad time. Sure. I just, I love, as soon as it starts, I am glued to watching the rest of the film. Well, and it comes back around a little bit at the end, too. You know, just hearing you describe that, I mean, I'm thinking of all these people who turn and look at her at yeah. the end. Yeah. And in, who she doesn't pay any attention right. to. Any other day, that could have been. Their right. lives that were fucked up yeah. for four years. Yeah. <laughs> it just happened to uh, the events didn't quite coincide. Yeah, you know, in the same way. Yeah, and you just have all these guys that are staring at Al. Or I guess it's Jane then. Yeah, we're sure. staring at <laughs> sure. Jane, wishing that they could do terrible, horrible, wonderful things to her. The other time you have everyone staring at her, she's also Jane. Yeah, it's really. True. I think it's just the name. Yeah. As soon as she's Jane, everyone is interested. Plain Jane Jones. Yeah, I really, really like that set. That whole uh, strip club, I mean, that stands out for me. Stands out for me, one, is one of the more surreal places. Yeah, well, and the the colors are so vibrant, whereas everything else is kind of dreary, gray London. Yeah, everything else feels like it's it's closer to documentary, Mm -hmm. and this feels like it's closer to stage. You know, it's a really classy kind of pink and purple uh, strip joint, and... Uh, a place where oddly the prodigy smack my bitch up is yep. always playing yep. regardless of what year it is a wonderful <laughs> world where smack my bitch up is still playing is on a constant loop <laughs> a song that i thought was perhaps not tactful enough for a place where everybody is in a suit yeah and uh and has this you know wonderful expensive looking lighting i'm just not going to expensive enough places yeah that's I, probably I think what that's, it is if you know a really really high end strip place like this one, especially if it's in Chicago. Even if it's not in Chicago. Yeah. Double feature show at gmail.com. Absolutely. Maybe we'll podcast from it. Fucking A. So we've already kind of toyed around with the fact that Natalie Portman has two names. Sure. Alice and Jane. Her real name is Jane, but she has this name Alice Ayers for the entirety of the time that she's fucking around with Dan. And that comes from this, it's not a graveyard, I guess it's a memorial garden or sure, something. Sure, sure where there's a bunch of plaques with the names of people who died saving other people's lives. Right, right. So I, I know we rarely, if ever, talk symbolism on the show, but I think that this is a really, really good moment because it'll roll me into another thing that I really want to talk about. Sure. So I really like the fact that she is Alice the entirety of the time that she's in love with Dan. And when she leaves him, she goes back to being Jane. Mm-hmm. Because she gets the name Alice from this people who saved people thing. Yeah. Which basically she's saying, as long as I'm Alice, you're not going to get hurt. Sure. And the second she stops being Alice, she's either fucking Larry <laughs> right. Right. or leaving Dan. Oh, interesting. I didn't think about that. Yeah. See, because when I saw, you know, save three children, yeah. I thought that was a dig at the three other characters. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, uh, you did not save those people right. at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it, you're right. It's only when she's with. Yeah. It's only when she's Alice and yeah. she's with Dan and everything is completely fine. Right. And then she's Jane. She's using a real name and she is destroying everyone. Exactly. And so that kind of brings me to this weird question that I think Closer just digs and digs and digs at, which is where is it ethical to sleep with other people if you really feel an emotional connection? Now, I understand that probably it makes sense to 
have a significant other, right? Realize you want to fuck somebody else, tell significant other, then fuck other person. Sure. That seems like the logical progression. But if you really have an emotional connection, an honest, true com- emotional connection that I feel like these characters really do, right. I feel like that is a serious component. They're to not them. quite just banging each right. other. Exactly. Yeah. Can you really blame <laughs> the other person? I, I'm not, I'm, I'm honestly not entirely sure of the answer. I yeah. would be in a very confused state if I were on either end of the sure. spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, uh, it seems like something you're compelled to do. Right. They make the argument towards the end of the film that there's sure. always a moment. Yeah. Where and you I agree with that. Resist. I fully agree with that. You know, and so if you've entered into these agreements with people, I suppose it's, I mean, it's definitely the wrong thing to do. Yeah. To betray that trust, even if you're going to come clean with them. Um, I don't think I've ever been in a position where I've ever cheated on anyone. Yeah. Well, neither have I. Although I have helped other people cheat on their boyfriends. Uh huh. So I, that's, and in my head until right now, I've never felt bad yeah. about that because it seemed like their life, I don't know anything about it. They know what they're doing. I'm not going to pretend I know how, you know, their relationship is laid out just as I don't expect them to, to pretend to know how mine is. Right. However, when you start getting involved with somebody who you're not just sleeping with, you're in love with and you would betray the the person you're currently with to mm-hmm. to be with them. I I'll tell you where the line definitely is. Okay. When you're seeing them in secret for a year, yeah. that's you yeah. you've definitely <laughs> at that point you have definitely crossed the line. Sure. I fully um, agree. I mean, I I think it's God man, I have no fucking clue. Yeah, I I, I think this is what happens. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I, th- I think Maybe not for a year. Seriously, a year? Yeah, that's a... It ends up, I don't even remember what we were doing on the show a year ago. Can you imagine if yeah. we'd been doing the show in secret for a year? <laughs> we did I mean, that once. How do you fucking keep a relationship secret for... A, I don't know. I guess people do it, though, right? Yeah. People have mistresses. People see prostitutes on the side. Now I'm just thinking about political scandals. I don't know. It comes easier for some people than others. I think it's one of those things where you put it in a place in your mind... Mm-hmm where you say, well, this isn't okay because of whatever weird excuse I've made up. Yeah. And then you just don't think about it. And a year later, something brings it up and you think, oh, crap, I should, we should probably, yeah, this, this is not good. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that, that is, that is, I think one of the more difficult things about closer to really understand is whether or not these people are wrong or not wrong, but bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether Ultimately, or not they're, they're bad, bad people. people. Sure. Yeah, I don't... Th- See, that's the thing. They're wrong, but I don't think they're bad people. Yeah. You know, and maybe I just have a lot of sympathy for the place they're in, for, sure. or empathy, I suppose. Sure. Uh, I just... They're living normal people lives, yeah. and they happen to have come across each other, and they can't fight it. They're given it... It's almost like the character's constant fights or non-fights with smoking yeah. the entire yeah. time. Yeah. I just feel bad for these people, even the one that wins. It's our duty to either do one of two things. One mm. is send everybody listening right now to Bag Cat. The <laughs> sure. other is cover a happier film. Yeah, you know what? Don't even... I know everybody's getting out their Bag Cat prematurely. Happy Go Lucky. Uh, this is something I fought to get on the show. Well, here. yeah. Well, so I this, think, no irony here. I think it really boils down to something you had heard of right. to get on the show. <laughs> My selection, no irony. I had heard of it first. Yeah. And now, now everybody knows. Yeah. So the film's from Mike Lee. And uh, I'm not a Mike Lee expert, but I feel like from the movies I've, I've seen of his, he's done some stuff that's maybe some mixture between dry and brooding. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Some kind of working class stuff and some very, they're very human stories. Uh, they're very much about people. I'm going to throw this term out once, and I think I've maybe only uttered it one other time on the show. Samurai stroller? No, it's a pretentious loaded term. So oh. here it comes. Oh, boy. I'm just getting everybody ready for this. The human experience. Wow. I don't like the term. A lot of people use the term pretty loosely. Mm-hmm. If you watch a lot of human experience shows, then it's probably no big deal Is that like to Fear you. Factor? It, uh, no, it's not like Fear Factor at all. It could be, depending on which human experience. The idea of these movies is simply that you spend some time with some characters, and that is the plot of the film. Uh-huh. When you look at Happy Go Lucky, there is no straightforward narrative. There, there's no roadmap. Yeah. Something we've called for before really yeah. needing in a film. True. 
And it's still, even though I, I love Happy Go Lucky, mm-hmm. it's still hard for me to watch a two hour film with yeah. no roadmap, not really sure where, where there's we're going. no there's no conflict to resolution sure. story. Yeah. You're just spending time with the characters to learn something. Yeah. And for me, you always have to be in a study mood mm-hmm. in order to see yeah. these films because I think that's what they're about. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, I think the strongest thing for me seeing this film for the first time, mm-hmm. the thing that kept me really engaged was the driving instructor. Sure. Scott. <laughs> sure. Well, that's the conflict. That's the source well, of conflict. Yeah, and it's, right? I don't even know if it's, it's constant. Just, I just like, I, yeah, it is. It's because that they're butting heads the sure. whole time. It's, it's a lot of electric uh, dissonance there. So to get back to Mike Lee for a second, but boy, don't worry, we will get to that driving oh, ex- good. instructor uh, because you're, you're already starting to find exactly what I'm looking for in this movie. If suicidal was a genre, I feel like that might be what Mike Lee does. Okay. Um, You know, if you're learning Mike Lee's stuff, this might be a terrible place to start. I think this is fairly well separated, although not unexpected in comparison to a lot of his other stuff. This is a sort of study of Poppy, who is played by Sally Hawkins. And all we need to say right now about Sally Hawkins, all I need to get off my chest here, is that... I'm exhausted just watching her after yeah. two hours. I don't know how she does this. Yeah. I'm just amazed. I can't, I can't even make myself smile for 20 right? minutes, let alone on set every day, being able to just... Re- she really has to be this character. Yeah, well, I mean, the, there are scenes where she's having conversations. The one that jumps to mind is when her and her coworker are at the bar, diner, restaurant sure. after the first sure. Flamenco lesson, and Poppy is sitting there contributing almost nothing to the conversation other than repeating what her friend says sure. and then saying some happy cliche. Yeah, she's found herself in a in a situation where she doesn't want to focus on the negative part of right. that. And so she's looking for the bright side in, yeah. in every single, you know, awful awful detail right. of what's happened. Right. There's a couple of places where that happens. You know, that's one of the things about uh, Lee's method is that he will, a lot of times he'll do movies without even really having a script set up. He'll focus on characters first and kind of work with the actors and and give them a sense of who the characters are, what they're going to be doing. So a couple of the characters from this movie, if not all of them, had basically no idea what this was a movie about. Uh They just intensely learned who their character was, what their character was about, what their character would do in these different situations. And then they just kind of played... Well, once you have those characters set up, you're ready for your character yeah, study, right? Exactly. What do you need to know about plot points? It's re- Today, you're going to be in a car. Yeah. You sit in the car, you react to what this guy says. And it makes for incredibly natural dialogue, yeah. given how unnatural a uh, premise this is. Well, yeah. And, and I, I don't want to get too much into it because, well, actually, there are two reasons that we can get into it. Sure. But Ricky Gervais jumps to mind when sure. watching Poppy. I was when just, watching thinking Poppy. That, just thinking that. The thing is, is when Ricky Gervais does, uh, we did Invention of Lying. Perfect mm-hmm. example. A lot of his asides and stuff he says in breaths, in lines, makes him seem like such a natural guy. Sure. Almost like he's not acting, like he's reacting to the strangeness that is surrounding him. Sure. And and I was hesitant to bring Ricky Gervais up, but we do get a, uh, a, a little conversation about traveling abroad and eating weird things. <laughs> right. Um, which, uh, which we can liken to a one Carl Pilkington's An Idiot Abroad. It's great because when you were talking about um, Ricky Gervais's ability to say things between breaths, I was thinking of how great Stephen Merchant is at that. Yeah, that's uh, true. Specifically portal stuff. But, you know, <laughs> in, in a lot of the stuff he's done with Ricky, the three of those guys, all fantastic. Absolutely and, fucking love them. And there's just not enough ways to get their stuff on our show. Need to make more movies. Yeah, The Invention of Lying is a movie where you take a premise mm-hmm. and then you sort of play with that premise. Yeah, and exactly. What would happen? And Happy Go Lucky isn't nearly as um, fantasy of a premise. Yeah. But you simply take the idea that this girl is extremely uh, positive, finds the good in basically Uh everything. And how would your life look if you were essentially never unhappy? Mm -hmm. Or you, at the very least... Saw the silver lining every time. Every single fucking time, right. And so we start in a pretty safe place. We start with... uh, you know, with scenes of the girls laughing incomprehensibly. I mean, you, you I yeah. barely have any idea what they're well, talking about. The thing, the thing about having a, a giggle of, party. Yeah, the thing about a lot of English movies and TV shows that I've noticed. I've watched this show uh, that came out on BBC Misfits, 
It's a great show. No idea. Highly no recommend this show. All awesome. Misfits. Um, but the thing about watching a lot of British shows that are made in Britain for Britain by the Brits, you need a good 10 minutes of acclimation to understand <laughs> sure. anything that anyone is saying. Sure. When well, you know, I have an especially hard time with yeah. that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, while we're backing all of British cinema in a corner, anyways, there's also a little bit of dry humor there where, you know, her jokes, a lot of times they'll fall flat, but that does not bother her at all. Yeah. You know, to the people in the room, no one detects that she just made a joke, but you see visibly that it amuses her. Yeah. And that's enough for her. Yeah. And she loves that, and that's fine, and she can go on. The music kind of gets the joke. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I don't know if the music gets the joke, or it seems just like her brain is composing the music. (laughs) Sure, it's yeah. almost like we're watching the movie through in her, her head. brain. Yeah, it has this kind of oboe clarinet. Yeah, there's score a weird oboe clarinet duo, yeah. but it's just it's really it's perfect for the movie. Yeah, especially when it's kind of dancing through the homeless guy scene. Yeah, only really once toward the end did I notice it really break into more string kind of stuff, mm-hmm. where she has that that moment thinking to herself. Beyond that, there's a a surreal kind of sense of whimsy about fucking everything yeah yeah and that adds sort of the comedic element you know if you've seen something like curb your enthusiasm mm, which uh, i they, haven't well they use that same sort of device with the music there uh-huh. where it gives you this kind of classic isn't this a funny situation we found ourselves in uh vibe mm-hmm. which is interesting in that show to pull you out of a lot of the darker situations yeah. the characters are yeah. actually involved in poppy even finds herself happy on the bus which for me, I, I know for a lot of people, we're going to get to the driving scene, you know, mm-hmm. talking about the homeless man, uh, the kid getting beat up at school. There's a lot of sort of dark places sure. the movie eventually goes to explore. Or tries what that to way. go. <laughs> right, right. You know, that stuff bounces off uh, pretty much just as well. But for me, being on a bus is pretty much, I like to think of myself as a generally positive person. Mm-hmm. I like to be really optimistic. I love people. I like being alive. I don't consider myself cynical however when i get on the bus it is about the most miserable place (laughs) on the planet i've tried to stop taking buses as i think i've mentioned several times on the show this has been my year-long project to get off of the bus yeah and depending on what time you take the cta in chicago sometimes it's business people going to work it's mostly people who look like they have a negative amount of money in their pocket. Yeah. They are less than homeless. Right. And they also have some kind of disease that makes them both sick and extremely unhappy. Mm-hmm. It's just a collection of crazies uh, or drunkards. And it's it's an amazingly dark fucking place to yeah. be. Just traveling on the bus from from place to place. Maintains her happiness even there. So it's weird getting used to a person like this. Especially if you, I mean, uh, nobody has somebody quite like Poppy in their lives. Mm -hmm. A lot of people probably can relate to having some character like this somewhere. But I think at first she comes off as airheaded a bit. Sure. And that's, I mean, that almost is sad to me upon, you know, a couple repeat viewings. You start Mm -hmm. to think, you get a sense of who this character is. You go back to the beginning and the mere fact that because she's happy all the time, you think she's a fucking dolt. Yeah. That makes me feel really awful. You know, she has this ability to have uh, serious conversations with people. She's talking about, you know, she uh, she has a sense of understanding. She's defending these parents who mm-hmm. don't have time to sure. take out their kids. Her mind is in the conversation. She's not someplace else, just, mm-hmm. you know, trying to stay in a happy bubble and ignoring what's right. around her. Yeah. She just comes off in a way that most people who tune out the world also happen to come out because that's... Maybe how they how they don't get drugged down when they're saying sure. I don't know on the bus. So then we start testing her reactions to things. You know her reactions to uh, negative people, which is probably the most amazing. Yeah, I mean it rolls right off. She is not face. Yeah, in the slightest. After we get used to that, we move right into well, let's try another experiment. How about if she's in pain mm-hmm. and she has these kind of giggling reactions, even to extreme pain? Yep, it's as if we're checking things off a list. That mm-hmm. come on. We have to find something to get this girl upset, yeah. and nothing is working. And so I think if we're going to keep with this idea of experiments, the logical end of that is when you're faced with somebody who doesn't even speak English uh, or a language, Yeah, they're speaking gibberish. She meets this uh, this homeless guy. Right. I assume he's homeless. I don't know. He's apparently sleeping in a he's bed. He's bearded. Tonight. Right. At the very least, bearded. Maybe he's just bearded. Right. 
And so he is not even uh, not even comprehensible, right? He's not. A, you have no idea what the fuck he's talking about. And this still, she does not miss a beat. She does not stumble for a second. She's right there having a conversation with a crazy person. Yep. Totally cool with it. It's amusing her. She's having a great time. She'll probably, you know, she thinks about all of these things later as stories, which is one of the few ways I found in my life to deal with crappy situations is to tell myself, this is so bad, it's going to make an amazing story later. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get to tell this to somebody else, and it's, it's going to be absurd how awful this was yep. in the moment. And she's constantly telling people you know, these stories about things like her yeah. driving instructor. But then she goes and justifies it. What do you mean? Well, she, she really good example. She picks on Scott for the racist thing. Oh, sure. Um, she picks on Scott for the Enraha thing. Yeah, right. And then her and her friends start ripping him apart a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And then she kind of goes, but, you know, maybe he's just, you know, oh, he sure, doesn't know any yeah. better. He's, he's, just a, he's just a nice guy. He's, I mean, he's a really good instructor. He's just... She's assuming positive intent. Yeah. She picks on him, but then immediately tries to repair any damage she may have done to their, sure. their reputation. Well, and ultimately, I mean, I think that's a great way to look at things. Sure. You know, she's saying, all right, this guy is racist, which is clearly wrong, but he's also just a fucking human being. Yeah. And I don't think he came out of the womb, you know, sure. evil. Yeah. So there's got to be a reason he's racist. And I wonder what that is. And it sucks that he probably has a shitty life yeah. as a result of that. And toward the end of the movie, you start to get people attacking her for, you know, not... Um, uh, she's constantly faced with this decision, you know, you have to grow up, you have to get a mortgage, you have to be an adult. Yeah. And you can't do what you're doing for right, your whole life. Right. Which Other she, people just think not okay. Yeah. Well, there's this weird assumption and I totally understand it. I've run into it myself because I'm a mid twenties musician. Sure. I mean, you've probably run into it too because you're in your mid twenties and you're an artist. <laughs> right. And people constantly will come up to you and ask, you know, what are you, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm in a band and I do a podcast and this and they're like, is that a permanent thing? <laughs> right. You know? So that's a temporary thing? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Goes yeah. back to closer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just this thing where people kind of brush you off as eventually you'll grow up and have a career and sure. then we can have a conversation. Right. When are you going to put on a suit? Yeah. I started putting on suits when I was 17 as a mockery of that right. very fucking thing. <laughs> and I, you know, I enjoy that a lot. I enjoy looking like a stupid kid. You have mm-hmm. no idea how, yeah. you know, I, I feel like I have a moderately successful life. But I look like I probably live paycheck to paycheck yep. and can't afford to eat. <laughs> I wear stupid fucking mall pants and I have not combed my hair in probably a decade. And I thoroughly enjoy giving someone the first impression of this kid has no fucking clue what he's doing and he's right. the least together person I know. And I feel fairly confident in being a responsible adult. Yeah, absolutely. And so maybe that's part of the reason I can kind of identify with how Poppy Mm -hmm. almost aspire to be more like her. You know what I mean? Totally. It seems like she's just gotten to a place that I only wish I could could achieve by 30. But one of the things that's thrown at her is you celebrate chaos, Mm -hmm. you know? And I I wonder, I mean, I feel like that's not entirely wrong. I feel like it's almost true that she, she celebrates chaos. Yeah. But is that bad? Well, I think... First of all, is that true? And secondly, is that bad? I don't know if it's 100% true. Mm -hmm. I think there are two different ways, two different sides to the celebrating chaos coin. One, it's, it's a matter of cause and effect. Sure. If you cause chaos for your own enjoyment, then you're celebrating chaos. Okay. That's option one. Sure. If option two, chaos causes your enjoyment right it's back to the same situation where she just rolls with it she can handle bad situations just as well as she can handle good ones and it's really not a matter of her being glad that there's chaos it's more that she's just glad that there is sure anything so that gets to really the ultimate question Uh uh, that i think the movie's driving at her which is was she flirting with scott by playing with the gear shift that is kind of the ultimate question you know, there's these very vivid characters in here, mm-hmm. and that's great when you're doing a character study is to throw other crazies at your sure. main protagonist, crazy. Sure. And uh, so we have the dance instructor who's yep. fucking amazing. Eccentric. And, and then Scott, who, uh-huh. of course, is also <laughs> fucking amazing. And so, you know, outside of uh, the only honest moments where she seems distressed with that, that kid being bullied, 
I mean, that's a vivid situation more than a character. Sure. I don't want to say the kid is an amazing character, right. but that's also a great place to, to put Poppy. We finally see what happens with her and Scott. And so by letting all of these things roll off her, she has kept herself in a situation that may be a little bit dangerous. Uh-huh. She ultimately comes to this confrontation because, I mean, when you're thinking about Scott, you're thinking this guy, first of all, he's a bit conspiratorial. He's mm-hmm. probably not all there upstairs, right? Sure. He's a little bit loony. He uh, seems to be an incredibly negative and hateful person. Mm-hmm. He's the ultimate villain because he's the antithesis of yeah. who Pop right, is. Right, exactly. And the only reason that he, you know, when you see these characters collide, Poppy stays with him because nothing bothers Poppy. Yeah. He stays with Poppy only because he needs to prove something to himself. Yeah, exactly. And so there is a great character-based reason as to why he wouldn't just... Because really, you would think if Magnets. you saw the... Yeah, if you saw the opposite of Poppy, yeah. that would probably be, I mean, completely repelled. Sure. Uh, you, there's no reason right. to keep those people together. Yeah. But you develop that character enough that they are... Uh, it's a situation where Poppy is just... I guess she's kind of trying to fix Scott or at least just get along with him. Right. And Scott is trying to fix himself through her. So the question I'm driving at then, is there something wrong with this positive outlook? Is this going to get you in trouble? What is the possible danger of never realizing when something is evil or when something is wrong or cruel? Well, I, I think that I think that there was a really clear moment before she actually got into the physical altercation with Scott when she was back with that homeless guy under the bridge. Sure. If that were any other homeless guy, it was dark. She was off the road. Right. That could have gone very badly. We feel fear for her. Yeah. She doesn't feel a whole lot of fear. Right. It's just this situation where she is lucky that that homeless man was nice and not rapey. Right. <laughs> nice and not rapey. But... It just, and, and I think that they tease you with that and go, this could have happened, but it didn't. But they give her not an equally bad situation, but still a bad situation to deal with. What ends is, up for her being a worse situation? Sure. Well, that's true. Scott's endangering them through driving. Sure. And he's endangering them through, well, I mean, he's in, he pulls her hair. Yeah. You know, they get into a little bit of a conflict. It's nothing where he would smash her face in and you know right. murder her. Mm-hmm. But it's and it's certainly... nothing like a really powerful, magnanimous God of Thunder like Jude Law slap. God, we didn't even mention that, did we? <laughs> so should people at least have some components of you know human devastation in, mm-hmm. in their life? Does that keep a person balanced, or can someone effectively live without that? I think the film points out that you don't need any misery <laughs> sure. to be able to survive. It's actually making the extreme argument. Yeah, she has a shitty situation. She resolves it the way a normal, clear person would. Like you said, it's not that she's disconnected from being in touch with other people. Right. She's not flighty and doltish. Right. She's completely able to cope with situations, to get in touch with people on an emotional level which she does with Scott, it's really hard for her. She's on the verge of tears. Sure. And later that day, she's in a boat with her best friend talking to her boyfriend. Right. right, right. I mean, it doesn't phase her, though. It, that could ruin someone else's day. Sure. They might call their friends, say, I was just attacked. Right. Everything is terrible. Could ruin their week. <laughs> yeah. But for her, she's just, she resolves it then and there, puts an end to it, and it's in the past. Yeah, this movie very easily could have said... The moral of the story is this is why you don't want to act like Poppy. It right. seems like a great ride at first, but look yeah. what could happen to you. Instead, it gives what's really the true answer, yeah, which is that this is just a different way for someone to behave in life. And these are the different effects that that might create. Yeah. And they're going to have trouble like anybody else, but they have their own unique way of dealing with mm-hmm. it. And at the end of the day... There's really nothing life-threatening or life-ending about this. It's not the end of the world if you always have a positive outlook and you, you, know, you don't grow up and you don't get a mortgage. That's not a fucking showstopper. That's just a different way to behave. Another way that you should behave is to go to doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, we also have an email where you can send us wonderful strip clubs or other fantastic information, uh, that's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. But back to this website, I know you've been working really hard on it. Yeah, you know, there's something on there that's... Uh, the, the great way this website is set up now, we can actually sort of look and see what people go to on uh-huh. the website. Yeah. Whereas before it was all built on top of Blogger and really awful. But um, there's a, a section at the top 
that people actually, it's the second most traveled to page on the site. And it is other projects. Huh. So basically what you're saying is people go to double feature and the second most likely thing that they're going to do is go somewhere else. Well, (laughs) yes, that's one way to look at it. The way I was going to look at it is the first question is list of films, A to Z. What have these guys covered? The second question is who the fuck are these people and why would I want to listen to them ramble for 40 minutes at a time? And thankfully, the other projects are all, I mean, by, by very necessity, by definition, they have to be better than this project yeah. because uh, this is us talking about movies. Yep. I mean, it really can't get much worse than this. So you can find all sorts of stuff on there. Uh-huh. Um, you can find a ton of your glitter mouse shit on there. Yeah. A ton of it. You can find that stupid video that I made. That stupid, wonderful video. It is. A, it's kind of a wonderful video. It's a really video. good video. I, I like it. It's, it's cute. Uh, I shot a video of your band. You can yep. find that on there. You can find uh, some other stuff that I did. There's, Your there's a lot photos, of photos, right? Your zombie march photos. Photos are on there. There's some photography stuff. There is a bunch of websites I made when I did a lot more programming. There's all sorts of goddamn stuff on there. You could keep yourself entertained for minutes, really. Yeah. Minutes of your time. As long as it takes you to realize that there's another link called Bag Cat, but that's for another day. So we're going to do a couple more movies next time on the show. Yeah. And uh, we're doing something different with the movies. We're going to move yeah. away from human beings. Yeah. Back into, let's say, some familiar territory. Yeah. Well, seemingly. <laughs> We've done road exploitation before. Sure. Oh, uh, to the point where our Before fans... you turn off your, yeah, your thank you. <laughs> MP3 player, this is a little bit different. To the point where Podmanity is banging their zunes on on their cave walls they threw them out back at mile marker 35 but we're gonna do something different we're gonna do um we're gonna do a james taylor film james taylor's the uh famous 70s songwriter and a film about um oh a tire (laughs) that's that is really i mean i think that's the official synopsis a film Um, about a tire yeah it's I'm, uh, i'm feeling a little bit of that black christmas behind the mask show yeah you know, that sort of beginning and end of sure. uh, what there was, the slasher genre. Yeah. And of course, it's not all inclusive beginning. Yeah. It's not the real beginning, and yeah. it's certainly not the real end. Yeah. But you uh, you take a concept, you give it a strong sort of origin. And or then you very... take it to its logical conclusion. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so <laughs> Tulane Blacktop is yep. uh, the first film. And sure. it's it's certainly not the first Rose no. Plantation film. But it's among the first and probably among the... It's a the great mo- example. Yeah, it is. And it's least. and it's really it's got the cult standing that we've we've managed to dodge with a lot of these sure. Real exploitation films. Sure, and for a film of its heyday, it's incredibly effective yep. at uh bringing philosophy onto the road. Right. And then the other one that's really effective at bringing a tire onto the road is uh it's a newer film called Rubber. I mean, it is literally a film about a tire. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>